Here we are on Mount Santa Rosa on the final defensive positions of the Japanese army on Guam. After the fall of the final defensive line and the ridges further south, the Japanese army withdrew to the northern part, uh, making a final large defense on Mount Barragada, which is over there. And when that fell after lots of bombardment, the final defensive position was right here here on Mount St. Rosa. Okay. General Bruce assigned the, cap uh, the capture of Barragada to the 307th Infantry. It was to maintain contact with the 3rd Marine Division on the left and push through the town and continue about a mile to seize Mount Barragada. The 305th to the right of the 307th would attack in the same direction east of the town and the Barragada Mountain and protect to the coast. The town was in a clearing, fully swept with defensive machine gun fire. And the same clearing was a much desired well. Its capture meant the world to the parched troops. At 6.30 a.m., 2nd August, General Bruce dispatched a dozen tanks of the 706th Tank Battalion under reconnaissance. As the recon armor turned into Barragada town, the enemy opened up with a torrent of fire. The determined Japanese fiercely resistant, resisted the 307th when it reached the town and were equally determined to stop the 305th on the right as that regiment's assault companies tried to outflank the town. Repeated tank attacks and heavy artillery support netted only a few yards at a time, but the soldiers kept advancing and by 4th August the 77th Division held the town, or what was left of it, and its precious well, and the crest of the mountain. Captured documents and interviews with prisoners again left little doubt that the 77th Division's major obstacle would be rugged, heavily crevassed, and jungled Mount Santa Rosa, here. It is six and a half miles northeast of Varagata and a short distance from the ocean on the east coast. First to be addressed on the way were well-armed outposts like Finnegayan and Yigo. Each promised casualties, blood, and delay. General Geiger employed the 77th to reduce Yigo and take Santa Rosa, and left the capture of Finnegayan and the rest of the Northern Guam principally to the 3rd Marine Division. He brought up General Shepard's brigade to assist in the final drive. To protect the forced beachhead line, care for the Guamanians, and hunt down enemy stragglers in the south, General Geiger tasked the 1st Battalion, 22nd Marines, and the 7th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion and the 9th Defense Battalion, all under Lieutenant Colonel Archie O'Neill, who commanded the 9th. Before moving on, the brigade had aggressively sought out Japanese holdouts, brought the fearful Guamanians into friendly compounds, and provided security for those who chose to remain in their own homes, and again, work their own ranches. As late as 2nd August, 4th Marines patrols approaching Talafofo Bay on the southeast coast came across some 2,000 natives still apprehensive of the Japanese, who were directed to a compound which promised safety and at least minimum comforts. The Guamanian people in their own residential and farm areas could, however, still readily call upon the civil affairs sections for food, protection, medicine, and shelter. Such civil care was integral to the American occupation and was controlled by Marine General Larson, who would head the garrison force as soon as the island was again under the American flag. During the night of 2nd and 3rd August, the 12th Marines delivered 777 rounds of harassing and interdictory fire on the roads and trails the division would encounter around Finnegayan. At 7 o'clock in the morning on 3rd August, the 3rd and 9th Marines moved in assault well past the Tinyan airfield. Then, at uh, about 9.10 a.m., the 9th encountered a block at the crossroads approaching Finnegayan village. The situation and terrain favored the Japanese with excellent fields of fire. After the Japanese position was finally overrun with tanks, Lieutenant Colonel Carey Randall, uh, commanding 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, said that these defenses were the toughest he had faced on Guam. That contest for Finnegayan was the last major battle for the 3rd Division on Guam. The Japanese made it something to remember. A 3rd Division Armored Reconnaissance Patrol headed for Ritadan Point on the northeast, northernmost point of the island, ran into Japanese defenses located on the Finnegayan Trails 
bristling with anti-tank weapons and artillery, pointed in the direction of the patrol. The Americans were surprised and bruised, did the Japanese some harm, but sensibly canceled the mission. The Japanese were plenty feisty at Finnegan, and in a telling thrust, dispatched two medium tanks, which skirted the crossroads of the 9th Marines at Junction 177, and went up the, to the Finnegan Mount Santa Rosa Road. Impervious to Marine fire, the tanks shot up the area and got away. Another tank force of under, undetermined size then rumbled down under cover of a mortar barrage and it looked like the beginning of a counterattack. Artillery stilled that Japanese effort. The, Jap the enemy tank, Japanese tanks were driven off but survived to reappear again another day. It was in one of those typical sudden enemy attacks around Finnegan that Private First Class Frank P. Wittek, with automatic rifle and grenades, raced ahead of his own tanks to destroy an eight-man Japanese position which was holding back elements of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. He succeeded but was killed. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Iron Honor. On 4th August, the new front lines and scheme of maneuver were set up to keep pressure on General Abada and his holdouts and make a place for General Shepard and his brigade. During the afternoon, the brigade reached its Northern Assembly area and General Shepard set up his CP near San Antonio. In the final advance north, the brigade would be on the left with its inland flank within a mile of the western beaches. The 3rd Division would be in the center, deploying its units on a three-regiment front, which would swerve to the east and take the whole northern end of the island as well. The Japanese now faced an overwhelming number of attack forces, and would be plenty of help from the sea and from the air. As General Bruce's soldiers made the principal corps drive to destroy the remaining Japanese and attack Mount Santa Rosa, priority of fires of corps artillery, air support, and ship's gunfire was now given to the Army. These new arrangements were to take effect on 7th August. Making new strides to end the campaign, the 23rd and 21st Marines progressed handily, but the 9th Marines kept running into dense jungle that was such a tangled mess the tanks passed each other 15 feet apart without knowing the other was there. The division accelerated this advance in battalion columns. On 6th August, it had progressed 5,000 yards along the road to Ritidan Point, the end of the island, and the end of the Battle of Guam. As that evening fell, the 3rd Division was in visual contact with the 77th Infantry Division, wherever all encompassed where the jungle allowed. Meanwhile, Heavy. Okay. Meanwhile, heavy 7th Air Force bombing, as well as artillery and naval shelling of enemy areas, had been going on for days. Night fighters were now assigned to support the advance, so even darkness afforded the Japanese no protection. At that same 6 August, the defense line that General Obada had set across Guam had been shattered and overrun. Only isolated pockets now existed before Santa Rosa. No American commander could say on 7th August when the fight with Guam would be over. General Bruce and his attack, first to Yigo and then Santa Rosa, would have a relatively fresh regiment, the 306th, which had come up from the south where it patrolled with the brigade. It was in contact with the 9th Marines on the division boundary. Colonel Douglas C. McNair, 77th Division Chief of Staff, was there too, seeking a site for a division CP, and he was killed by a sniper. Colonel McNair's father, Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair, was killed in France 12 days earlier during an American bombing raid. The attack on Mount Santa Rosa began at noon on the 7th of August. Behind the rumble of artillery and rattle of tanks answered in, by, in kind by the enemy, which means they shot back, the 77th took Yigo, the door to Santa Rosa, and continued General Bruce's wheeling maneuver. Bulldozers blazed trails and tanks and infantry overran machine gun positions. The 77th was dug into positions on the night of 7th, 8th August, ready for the final attack on the mountain. The expected big Japanese counterattack still did not come. The rapid advance of the Americans, accompanied by heavy artillery, supported likely forestalled that forlorn hope. Two regiments, the 305th and 307th, proceeded rapidly on 8th August, and by 1240, the northern half of southern Mount 
Mount Santa Rosa was in American hands, and the troops moved to secure the rest of the mountain. By 2.40 in the afternoon, the army had reached the cliffs by the sea and could look right down to the ocean. The 3 6 Infantry had also completed an enveloping move to take the northern slopes of Mount Santa Rosa. Only 600 enemy bodies were found after the two-day flight for Yigo and Santa Rosa. Yet, estimates of the enemy personnel on Santa Rosa had been as high as 5,000. So this meant that the enemy troops in significant number now infested the jungle terrain everywhere on Guam. Worse, some enemy tanks were also unaccounted for. Enemy survivors of the Mount Santa Rosa battle kept drifting into the night Marines lines on the army flank, slowing the regiment's advance. Sharp-eyed Marines noted that more than a smattering of enemy movement near a particular hill in the army zone. This was believed to be the command post of General Obata. Third Marines on the left of the division zone had progressed with the same occasional enemy opposition. A 19-man roadblock held up the Marines but was taken out quickly. And searching a corridor between the 3rd and 9th Marines, the 21st Marines came upon the bodies of 30 Guamanians near Chai Guan. They had been beheaded. The brigade headed a little easier on the far west, found negligible resistance as it advanced along fairly good trails. On 8th August, a patrol of 22nd Marines reached the Ritidian Point, uh, the northernmost point of the island. Moving along a twisting cliff trail to the beach, the Marines encountered less than aggressive Japanese defenses which they quickly overcame. General Shepard's 1st Provisional Marine Brigade held the distinction of being the first to reach both the southernmost point of the island in the early days of the campaign and the northernmost section of Guam at Ridiadan at this time. General Shepard's Marines began vigorously patrolling the area as they occupied but found few Japanese. As a result, General Geiger reduced the amount of naval gunfire placed on the area, while the Saipan-based 7th Air Force's B-47s made their last bombings and strafing runs on Ritiadian Point. The 22nd Marines were down below the cliffs at Ritiadian, scouring along the beaches where they had many caves. The 4th Marines were on the north coast of Menangaran Point and tied by patrols to the 22nd Marines. At 6 p.m. on 9th August, General Shepard declared organized resistance had ceased in his zone. It was not so easy for the 3rd Marines. On the 9th, uh, 8th 9th August near Taragui, the regiment was hit by a last resort Japanese mortar and tank attack. Marine anti-tank grenades and bazooka rockets were wet and ineffective, and the Japanese blazed away with impunity and then ducked back into the woods. Amazingly, when Major Culpepper, commanding of the 2nd Battalion, had been, uh, counted heads, he found that he had suffered not a single casualty. Now we'll read the uh, citation for Private Witek. Private First Class Witek's Medal of Honor hailed inspiring acts. First Class Frank Peter Witek Medals of Honor citation reads as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving at the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, 3rd Marine Division, during the Battle of Fenangan at Guam Marianas Islands on 3rd August 1944, when his rifle platoon was halted by heavy surprise fire from well camouflaged enemy positions, Private First Class Wittick daringly remained standing to fire a full magazine from his Browning automatic rifle at point blank range into a depression housing Japanese troops, killing eight of the enemy and enabling the greater part of his platoon to take cover. During his platoon's withdrawals for consolidation of lines, he remained to safeguard a severely wounded comrade, courageously returning the enemy's fire until the arrival of stretcher bearers, and then covering the evacuation by sustained fire as he moved backwards toward his own lines. With his platoon again pinned down by hostile fire, uh, Private First Class Wittek, on his initiative, moved forward boldly to the reinforcing tanks and infantry, alternating throwing hand grenades and firing as he advanced to within five to ten yards of the enemy position, and destroying the hostile machine gun emplacement and an additional eight Japanese before he himself was struck down by an enemy rifleman. 
His vigilant and inspiring action effectively reduced the enemy's firepower, thereby enabling his platoon to attain its objective and reflects the highest credit upon Private First Class Wittick and the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Rest in peace. Patrols of the 9th Marines advanced to Paddy Point, the northeast projection of the island. Intelligence sources then reported to Colonel Craig that a mass of Japanese, maybe 2,000 troops, were holed up at Savannah Grand, which is a wild tract of jungle, coconut trees, and high grasses near the coast. Colonel Craig did not want to risk casualties so close to the end of the campaign. So the artillery supporting the 9th Marines fired a total of 2,280 rounds. The few Japanese survivors were either killed or became prisoners. The final American positions formed along the coast. By nightfall of 8th August, Colonel Craig's Marines could wave to the soldiers of the 306th patrolling to their south. General Geiger was not ready to declare Guam secure until a pocket of tanks still existing in the 3rd Division zone was wiped out. That had to be done by the 10th, but that was the day Admiral Nimitz was scheduled to arrive for a visit. There were tanks indeed, and the task of finding and eliminating them was given to Major Culpepper's 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines. Advancing at 7.30 in the morning, the battalion and a platoon of American Sherman tanks soon found two enemy mediums firing only 400 yards up the trail the Marines were following. The Shermans left their counterparts black and burning. Seven more enemy mediums were abandoned. A Japanese infantry, infantry platoon withdrew to the coastal cliffs and was killed there. On that day, 10th August at 11.31, as he learned that the last Japanese tanks still in action had been destroyed, General Geiger declared that all organized resistance on Guam had ended. It was a great day for the Guamanians. The island was theirs again. It was also next to the last day for General Obata. His Mount Nataguao position was strongly defended, so much so that when the 306th had tried to force it earlier, it failed. On the morning of 11th August 1944, when the general knew his headquarters had been discovered and the enemy was coming for him, Obata signaled to the emperor, We are continuing a desperate battle. We have only our bare hands to fight with. The holding of Guam has become hopeless. Our souls will defend the island to the very end. I am overwhelmed with sorrow for the families of the many officers and men. I pray for the prosperity of the empire. The 306th made the last assault, supported by tanks and demolition squads. The enemy defenders killed seven Americans and wounded 17 before they went down to defeat, buried in the rubble of blown caves and emplacements. General Bada took his own life or was killed sometime during those last hours of the Battle of Guam. Japanese soldiers are still found from as late as 1962 and even into the early 1970s here in these jungles. This is the final defensive position on Mount Santa Rosa.